on behalf of the directors of the HEDS Consortium, I would like to welcome you to our best practice showcase celebrating technology innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. My name is Naomi Curet, and I will be in charge of introducing the speaker for this breakout section. This section is being recorded. The presenters will let you know whether you will be able to address your questions at any time during the presentation or after the presentation has finished. The, this presentation will be delivered in English. Simultaneous translation is available in channel 5. Additional headphones are available in the exhibitor area at the rotonda. We will appreciate that you change your mobile phone to vibration or silent mode in order to have your full attention to this session. Finally, we will distribute the evaluation form. Please make sure to complete, complete it before the session is over and hand it in before you leave this room. Now we are ready to start. The presenter for this session is Gillian Abbott. His uh, biography information was included in the conference app and website. The title of the presentation is Visual and Actual Learning Communities in the Same Classroom, a Case Study of Multiple High Impact Practices. Welcome. Welcome, Gillian. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, everybody, for coming this morning. Um, uh, this is actually a, a joint presentation with a colleague, Barbara Lynch. I'm a, a lecturer in the English department at Queen's Community College. Barbara is a lecturer in the speech department. And uh, last year, uh, it was spring 2015, Barbara has, at the beginning of every course, she has a survey um, that asks her students a, a number of questions just, just to get an idea of where her students are in, in the beginning of the course, what they're aware of, what they're not aware of. And one of the questions that she always includes is, what is your name? And when she asked her students the question, what is your name, more than half of them answered Gillian Abbott. <laughs> so <laughs> we thought, um, uh, there must be something going on here. What, why is this? And we discovered that we had a block. We didn't know that we had a learning community. Nobody told us. But we had a block of classes together. Same students, different disciplines. And because Barbara and I have a long history of working with multidisciplinary uh, projects, we thought this was just too good of an opportunity to pass by. We needed to do something with this. So we developed a, a project in common. And then we discovered that our students overall had uh, perhaps as many as four, even five, high impact practices, all in the same class, all with the same students. So. Um, uh, this presentation is in some ways a cautionary tale because um, Queensborough Community College is very much involved with the um, American Association of Colleges and Universities a high impact practice program. So we're involved with a lot of programs with them, but we're very interested in the high impact practice. Our student population is very diverse. I think it's about uh, 20, Kathy, Kathy, another colleague of mine might correct me, about 28% Hispanic. Yeah. 28% yes. Hispanic, about the, um, about the same proportion African American, but more importantly, over 40% of our student population is born outside of, um, uh, of America. So this is a population that in, in many ways can use a lot of help. You know, they can use a lot of help just integrating into the American system, just getting themselves to college, getting themselves into the classroom, you know, being able to listen in English. All of these things are additional challenges that our students face. So um, when the AACNU began to develop these uh, high impact practices, Queensborough paid very close attention and, and at one point we were um, a designated college with the AACNU doing a number of pilot projects. I was involved in a pilot project uh, of doing assessment. So the high impact practices that they identify that um, AAC and U uses, there's writing intensive, uh, undergraduate, undergraduate research, service learning, and collaborative assignments and projects. The projects that um, Barbara and I 
are mostly involved in fall under the um, collaborative projects. Uh, these are also supported as high impact practices by the by the um, uh, the administration at Queensborough Community College, and um, there's a lot of evidence, which I, some of which we presented <laughs> yesterday. I don't have it in this presentation, but there's a lot of evidence that high impact the impact of high impact practices it, it runs the whole gamut of you know passing rates, retention rates, and um, graduation rates because one of, you know we have many students enroll many fewer graduate but um, with careful and um, systematic uh, application of high impact practices we find that those graduation rates uh, increase uh, what Barbara and I actually found was something else we what we found is that we kind of overwhelmed them so we wanted to put this presentation together as a kind of a cautionary tale of like too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. It's not that it was a bad thing overall. The students who totally engaged, I, I have the figures at the end, the students who totally engaged in this learning community did brilliantly. The grading was A and B, nothing, <laughs> and F. So it, I think that what happened is that we overwhelmed them and there was just too much going on. And we thought that the, this is a good thing to talk about, just to kind of let people know that you know, there's, there's only so much that most students can take on. So in Barbara's speech class, she had four high impact practices. She had the block class, that's the actual learning community with me, which we did a collaborative project. She had the students working in interdisciplinary groups. She had a common intellectual experience. And with the suite, it was actually the two suites. I had, um, I had a block class with her, and I had just the students working in interdisciplinary groups. Uh, but those, uh, I think a few of you were at our presentation yesterday, but um, SWIG, which is Students Working in Interdisciplinary disciplinary Groups, promotes integrated collaborative learning across participating classes. Students from courses in different disciplines use technology to collaborate and exchange ideas, often asynchronously, while learning to recognise and apply different disciplinary lenses in their thinking. Sweet assignments move the classes from a teacher-centered to a student-centered space where peers are the audience for learning and dialogue. So how that usually works is, um, you know, for example, my suite, I, my students create digital stories. I have one to show you. I, I, have, I apologize to anyone who was here yesterday. It's, it's one we've already seen. But my students begin by writing a... Um, a personal narrative. We read a lot of personal narratives. We have a textbook that's kind of full of personal narratives. We read a lot of personal narratives. My students create a personal narrative and they then adapt that into a digital story. So they, <clears throat> I mean, for all intent and purpose, they make a little movie. Um, <clears throat> what I did with my sweet collaboration is that I worked with um, an acting faculty and music faculty. So my students wrote their personal narrative the acting students, they put it on a wiki so that the acti acting students could download it. They interpreted it and recorded it. And then they put it back on the wiki so that my students got the opportunity to hear somebody else reading their paper. You know, somebody kind of interpreting it as a character because they were actors. The other thing, uh, the, the music students would download it, they, re they read it, and then they... In tried to come up with some kind of musical interpretation because ideally a digital story has sound as well as images, you know, sound and movies, images. So uh, then they take all of that, they take that information, they create a script, they adapt it to a script and then they um, make a digital story using, ideally using the music and, and the recording that's uh, given. There's a second stage in my week in that um, uh, what happens is uh, they give it back and they put up their they put up their script, and the acting students then read the script. The script is the the soundtrack to the digital story. So um, it's probably making more sense to the people who saw it yesterday. But a lot of the interaction, a lot of the learning, is completely student centered. It takes place on a wiki where it is student to student. I don't interfere in that in any way. They put their work up there. The other students take it down and interpret it and put it back up. So the interaction is purely student to student. And that's, 
I think, as I said yesterday, that's where a lot of the magic happens in that in that wiki situation where they're meeting. Not a lot of times they don't even meet in person, not even once, but they're sort of meeting via their work, and there's a whole lot of things going on with that. Um, Barbara's assignment. Um, this is a common intellectual experience. Actually, I thought I had a. Uh, I think uh, the other thing that she did. I, I didn't do this. I've, I've done this. It's actually very good. It comes uh, under the AAC and used common intellectual experience. So what happens is the whole campus, many, many, many faculty, maybe I don't know how many, 40, 50, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I think it's up to like 80, 80. or something this year. Yeah, so uh, it's about 80 faculty throughout the whole um, whole campus and, and throughout every discipline, through the STEMs, through English, through humanities, everything. Uh, we all read the same book. And then there's a whole series of projects, you know, there's meetings, there's a read aloud, which is always fun. Uh, a lot of students come together and they, each student just reads at it. It's actually a lot of fun. Uh, they, and, and some of the students said they've never heard of a, a book uh, read out loud. Um, so uh, there'll be you know, presentations, there'll be movies, uh, there'll be all sorts of associated events. And the whole, every faculty member who's participating, their students are going to all of these different events. So it's called Common Intellectual Experience. Uh, and designated by the American Association of Colleges and Universities. Students read a book selected by faculty at QCC that is also being read to many, by hundreds of students in other courses and disciplines. Why? To make connections with other students and disciplines on campus for a me more meaningful educational experience. Common read learning objection, uh, uh, learning outcomes are explain the connections between the common read text and the event attended, explain the connections between their course and the common read text, draw conclusions from more than one perspective or field of interest. Again, if you were in our presentation yesterday, this this is a, a it, this is a very common theme in Queensborough Community College's high impact practices. The idea of tra really it's the idea of transfer of of seeing if in one from one disciplinary perspective, but also from gaining an understanding of how that applies to another disciplinary perspective, or how your disciplinary perspective can inform theirs. You know, which as you move through subjects, how each disciplinary perspective can inform and enhance the others. And uh, we we spoke yesterday about the whole silo thing, where you know this is English, and what happens in English stays in English. It's not really like that, you know. Or oh, we hope it's not really like that. That's not the idea. So, um, uh, so Barbara's students who read the book "Until I Say Goodbye" by Susan Spencer Wendell. Attended three related activities on campus and wrote a reflection. Researched in a formative speech of four to seven minutes based on the theme from the book. A persuasive speech of four to seven minutes, topic based on on the topic of the informative speech, group project of the SWE group. So at the same time that these students, who were my students, the, it was a group of students, it was about 25 students. And those 25 students were doing this thing with me, uh, with the acting students, with the, with the music students, creating a digital story. With Barbara, they were doing this also. They were doing the common read, they were attending all these events, and they were um, having to write reflections and use, use the material to, to create informative speeches. Um, that's just, I'm not going to read that whole, whole thing. Uh, oh, well, I will. Uh, just to say this. We, this. This persuasive speech was the way that we could meet. We felt like, we, we didn't know in advance, but we felt like this was a great opportunity. Let's try to do something. You know? So the only way that I could incorporate it in, in my syllabus at that late stage was through the exam. Because part of freshman composition at Queensborough, and in, in fact most places I think, is to write um, persuasive writing. So what I did was I tried to um, have them use what they were learning in speech and what I was teaching them in English and, and use that as the essay, the persuasive essay that they had to write in the class anyway. So. Um, so I just said, this exam is in two parts. The first part is an essay, the second part is a reflection. You must complete both parts. Uh, I'm sure you all have to do that. <laughs> Please 
explicit uh, instructions. So it's read the speech by Robert Reagan on socialized medicine. You have studied this piece in speech, so you will need to be able to apply what you learned to speech to this English exam. Um, and of course, we did look at it in English as well. Then read the speech by Pen uh, President Kennedy on the same issue. What techniques of persuasion is each speaker using? Which speech do you feel makes a stronger argument? Why? What counter arguments do you provide? Do, do each provide against each other? Which speech do you agree with, and why? Are you persuaded by these arguments, or has your position on healthcare remained the same despite the speech? Please use examples from each speech. So basically, the exam in, in freshman English is is a text that you've studied in class, a text that you haven't ever seen before, and compare and contrast. So I use the the speech rather than. You know, we can do we can look at any kind of writing, and one of the things that you have to do is look at persuasive writing. So it all kind of did come together in the end, and they were able to put this exam together. But more importantly, we really wanted to see how um, studying the same piece of writing from two different, you know, with different keywords, different emphasis, different way of using the speech, how that affected. So in the reflection. Uh, this semester, you, you'll participate in a virtual learning community suite with drama and music and a traditional learning community with speech and English. Are you aware of the difference in your learning in the virtual uh, learning community versus the actual learning community? What are the differences between speech and English? Which one helped your learning more? Why? So I'm just trying to get them to think about, you know, just to, to spend a little minute thinking about, well, what, what does speech, <coughs> what is speech, Speech's take on this. What is English's take on this? And just have them write that. So uh, with Barbara, their assignment with me, the block course was a, was a persuasive sweet speech. With me, it was a persuasive essay, and um, she also used that book. So there's a lot of <laughs> stuff here. Um, the common intellectual experience. This is the sort of thing that Barbara did. She did read the book. Oh, if anyone's got any questions, just ask. Uh, read the book until I say goodbye, class discussion, attend the things, write a reflection on each, choose a topic for an informative speech based on the theme of the book, choose the topic for the speaking collaboration. So um, the actual learning commission, the actual, learn, you know, the thing about this is it was all the same students. They were doing all the virtual stuff and they were doing all, all the thing. I, I don't know how any of them survived to tell you the truth, but anyway. So the lessons were defined persuasion using Aristotle's ethos, logos, and paper. Um, and that is exactly what we do. It's, it's kind of interesting when you, when you do teach with other disciplines because that's exactly what we do in English, but we just do it with a different emphasis and a different way of looking at them. Uh, uh, covered fallacies, turning an informative message into a persuasive one, uh, using either problem solution schemes from or Munro's motivated sequence. Assignment, a four to seven minute speech based on informative speech topic. So I thought that was quite a good assignment, you know, to take the speech, to take what was informative and turn it into persuasive. At least three content PowerPoint slides, with one being a chart or a graph, at least three articles or other types of support. So this is very specific detail about her, um, her learning community. Uh, this is the, this was her suite now. Barbara's, these same students were doing that once we were working with music and acting students with me. At the same time, with Barbara, they were working with uh, biology students and English students to create, to do a whole other set of work. So all group members should contribute to the project equitably in that each participant in the discussion on the wikis is assigned and expected. To be specific, each member should do the following. Uh, one of the problems that we do find with this just in a regular suite is that if my students write their, um, if my students write their personal um, narrative and they put it on the wiki and the acting students or the music students don't come along and don't do their part, it's very difficult, you know, because we're all waiting. I think any, any of you that have worked in groups know this is a, is a really, so Barbara actually gives a, a grade for group work. So just just to try to keep them, um, just to try to motivate them to do it because a lot of times when there are problems it's to do with one group or, or students not, not putting their bit in. 
So help with research by finding and evaluating, see evaluation sheet, at least one piece of support material to be judged by biology students. Biology students will then narrow the topic and decide what needs to be covered by the project. Help finding human stories to be reviewed and selected by English members. Each student will locate at least one story on the topic for the English students to judge. Help with writing the script. English students will place first drafts on the wiki. All students will give suggestions and edit. Help speech students with PowerPoint. Each student will contribute at least one picture or, or chart or graph for the speech students. So we have this process in, um, in SWIG of gift giving. Gift giving is when you, you read and interpret uh, another person's work and give them some kind of visual or audio or, or video, so, some kind of um, a piece of um, media that thematically interprets the work so that they can then use it to refine their own work. Um, so this is what she's talking about here. Uh, help speak student with PowerPoint. Each student will contribute at least one picture chart. That's what I'm saying. Help with PowerPoint. The speech students will write first draft of the PowerPoint. All students will give suggestions and edits. Help with the voiceover. So the process of making a, a digital story is you begin with a script, then and a PowerPoint, and so they record their voiceover. In, in my instance, they had the option of, of using an acting student, a professional acting student voiceover. In this instance, uh, they had to do their own voiceover, but they got help with the script. So the elements of the digital, they were both making digital stories in both uh, classes. The elements are the visual, the writing, you know, there might be some words on the page, um, and the sound. And, and what they do is they use a program called Audacity, and if they want to do it at college, they use Camtasia, or if they want to do it at home, they use iMovie or, or Windows Movie Maker, or whatever software they've got. And they bring those all together uh, to make a little movie. So help with the voice of all students will submit an audi audition tape to the speech students. They will judge and decide which part of the voiceover will be done by whom. They will record and coach each other on their oral presentation. Students will elect a tech team to create the actual digital story. All students will monitor the progress and make suggested edits. So with Barbara's, it was, with my class, it, they each had to make their own individual digital story. With Barbara's class, they would make a group one, you know, saying four of them would make one. Um, Joe, could I ask a question? Sure, yeah. Um, in terms of assessment, is it is it each class given uh, its own assessment rate, or, or is it a combined assessment rate? Well, uh, the group given work... Given the logistics of the yeah. two problems. Uh, well, on mine, their, their exam got a, got a grade for a persuasive essay. I just graded it simply as a persuasive essay, but, but had the awareness that, that they participated in this other thing. I think with Barbara's, they get a group grade. They get a group grade. They're, they're making it, each one of my students is making a digital story, so they get graded individually. Barbara's, they're making them in groups, so she is assessing the group. But she, Barbara's had a lot of experience with groups and she knows that, you know, quite often one student's done all the work. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if anyone's had that experience. <laughs> um, so she, she also gives a grade for, how, you know, a weighted grade for how well you participated. And she gives a grade for the thing. But the, st the statistics that Cathy showed yesterday, they are individual, each class is separate. There's no cross-class grading. There's no grade for your participation in SWIG. Although it's an interesting idea because um, I, I think at one point we discussed something about that, uh, you know, maybe a certificate or, or an additional notation on their transcript that they participated in, in one of these. Because it is quite a different experience, you know. Would, would you consider like a portfolio assessment? Is that possible or, or, or that, given, well, given the dynamics that they're doing, you know, uh, essays and, and you know, multiple things. What, what? Well, um, you know, it's an interesting question because we had, we originally SWIG was based on the Epsilon uh, e portfolio. And the idea of the e portfolio is that the students create a portfolio, that they have a portable portfolio to take with them. And, and a requirement of every SWIG class was that they post their final digital product, whatever it was on the portfolio, so then, and, and there were grand plans in, <laughs> that they would do a, you know, 
a cornerstone, um, you know, a, a middle one and a, a capstone, of course. Uh, Epsilon went broke and we had to switch to digitization and we kind of floundered. We didn't know what to do for a couple of, we were sort of, I don't know if anybody here uses ePortfolio, but e Epsilon went bankrupt and so that we lost our, our um, what do you call it, platform. So that was difficult, but um, there isn't there isn't at the moment because of that. There's no longer a portfolio thing, but I think a portfolio thing is a really great idea. I mean, these students in this class, the ones that survived, <laughs> they would have come out with, with really amazing work. You know, they all did really. The ones, like I say, in my class they got A's and B's, and when we looked at Barbara's class, the same thing happened. They got A's and B's, no C's and D's, and a bunch of F's for either failing or dropping out. You know. So the ones who survived this would have had fabulous portfolios. I, I think it's a great idea is what I'm saying. Yeah. Well worth consideration. Um, yeah. So this is, these are the prompts. Uh, I have two, I give them two choices. Um, they can either write about um, their journey to their ad towards their academic. It's called uh, uh, an integrated um, personal, academic and professional towards an integrated um, identity. Well, I'm just trying to have them draw on their high school experience, what, what they're doing now and where they want to see themselves, and try to create a, um, a, a kind of a cohesive picture of where they see themselves going what, you know, and, and what informs those decisions, why, who, who the important people are and things like that. And they read a bunch of these uh, <coughs> uh, personal narratives themselves. Um, the other one, I give them also a choice migration. The digital story I'm going to show you is, is to do with migration. Um, but, um, yeah, I was thinking about the portfolio, I just lost my train of thought. But, but the main <coughs> thing is that they have to, you know, they have to fulfill so, so many different things in, in both classes that I think they've kind of got lost. So the outcome, uh, he's digital story, which I hope, this, this student was in both classes, so he also did a digital story in his. I don't have his digital story here, but this is the kind of work that they were doing in my class. Uh, apologies to anyone who saw this yesterday. Uh-oh. Uh Joining and blending in one mighty and irresistible task. The land flourished, but it was spared from so many sources. Um, the laws that were flourished by some. Does anybody know about it? Oh, it's reloading. Sixth President of the United States, Lyndon B. Johnson, to which was in terms of the United States. It translates to the theory that the United States is the great country that it is today due to the great variety of culture and traditions of the immigrants that came here. If it weren't for the great many who came to the United States from foreign countries, the United States as we know it would have a completely different appearance. For the term American has taken a variety of shapes within the years. The story of my family's migration begins in South America. My mother, born and raised in Bogota, Colombia, never seemed to get tired of speaking of the place where she comes from, whether it's about the beauty of her landscape or the deliciousness of her food. Being one of nine brothers and sisters in her middle class family, she was no stranger to tough times. She would share stories of long bus rides and long walks to get to school, and also gymnastics and swim team meets. As she would tell us stories of these obstacles she had to face, I saw where the drive to succeed and overcome had stepped from in my mother. Things in Colombia were getting tough, however, and at the age of 17, my mother had to make a migration of her own. She would get on a plane to travel 2,494 miles to an unfamiliar land in the hopes of a better life. She would head to the United States and go to New York to live with her brother. 
Not knowing any English, she told us stories of being lost in the middle of the city and not being able to get her way home, and also the difficulty of finding a job right away. Not to mention having her first car stolen within the first three months of owning it. Despite these obstacles, never did she give up hope on making things work. She began to learn more and more English and enrolled herself in school and attended Hunter College in New York City. With rent and tuition over her head, she had used what she learned in Columbia to help her push through the rough situations she found herself in. My mother is a clear example of the true nature of migration. Her strong values and relentlessness is what Lyndon Johnson would consider as nourishing the land. If it wasn't for her migration, she would never have passed down her teachings of determination and hard work to her children now living in America. Her children that would now be the future of the country and would be considered Americans. However, she made sure we would never forget where part of our family tree had originated. She made sure that we had learned her native language, Spanish, and fed us with the delicious foods like rice and beans and empanadas. These are the things that make me proud of my mother's migration and thankful for the migration of all the others that came to this country to make it the amazing place that it is today. Okay. So that, that's um, an example of a student answering the question of migration. I also have one <coughs> here. This is, um, this one is answering the um, Oh, looks like I'm not going to see that. Like the login to education. Oh, that's a digitization. It's not his. Oh, okay. I get it. I can't. I can't do that right now. Okay. So that the other one that I the, the other one that I had um, showed the um, answering the towards an integrated identity, but um, these are the outcomes. Um, from Barbara's class, some of the outcomes. Uh, I think there's a digital story from, from one of her students too on this um, thing. But basically she, she had the students doing um, reflections. Uh, so on transfer, the topics in speech help me understand the work students of other disciplines have to do. When collaborating with the biology students, I was really interested <coughs> in the topic of haemophilia. I had never researched it before or had an extensive desire to. After being assigned it to, to, to it, I studied the terminology associated with haemophilia and loved it. I loved being able to pronounce, record and define medical terms. It made me proud and certain of pursuing my career as a doctor. So I know that student can, uh, actually there's an interesting story about that student because uh, 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 she, was a, she, she wanted to be a doctor and she didn't really do any work. And I had taken her aside and I read her the right act. I said, you are going to fail this class. You're not going to become a doctor. You're going to fail this class. And I mentioned it to Barbara and Barbara said, oh, I said the same thing to her. <laughs> so she ended up, she did really, really well. She, she, like, she finally, I think she'd done very well throughout all of her school. You know, she was one of those students who just sailed through. And she got to college and the whole thing was falling apart. She wasn't doing her work. And Barbara and I working together, we both told her the exact same thing, the exact same week, you know. And suddenly she just rose to the occasion. She did a, I don't have her digital story, but she did a brilliant digital story for me. She did a brilliant one for Barbara. And so it was really an example of when it's working, you know. When, and, and also just that, because it's more than just doing these assignments together. We were kind of team teaching, you know. You know and it really helps to talk about the students and you know, to, to work together in that way. So this one is also on transfer. Luckily I was able to be part of three different communities, English, speech and theatre. There are many differences and similarities with each of these communities. The English and speech community was a collaborative class that made my learning process easier. In English we learned about making movies and choosing what is relevant to our topic and strategically deciding on what we want to portray. This helped incredibly with speech class which consisted of many digital stories and PowerPoint presentations. Simultaneously, they worked hand in hand perfectly. I can most definitely use what I learned in both classes for mere that I'm not too much in for that, that I can use pages of information and put them into a presentation for two or three minutes. This is a skill within itself. The disciplines are different in a way, 
English class felt much more personal due to the digital story project which we had was based on ourselves and our identity. On the other hand, in speech class, it dealt more about social issues, which was also very insightful. So I think one of the feedbacks I get more than anything is they say, by doing your class, I not only learned how to write, but I learned about myself, which I always, I always enjoy that, because I kind of feel like I get some started. It's freshman English is their first semester, and it kind of gets some started already thinking about where they want to end up. Uh, so working together. Throughout my speech <coughs> communications course, I had assignments assigned with people I didn't know at all. That's, that's one of the beauties of the asynchronous. You know, we were a block class, so they knew that, but the asynchronous ones were only meeting online. They never actually met in person. Now, after concluding with my course, I strongly believe that communication in any way is the most important base in which I feel that I could, I could have made the process easier by communicating more. Sending emails every day, setting, arranging sessions to meet up and do the work in QCC. I believe that I did all my responsibilities, but I must admit I had a few of my work not posted in the due dates. For example, I will have it up after a day or even three days late. I could have motivated my group members by creating previews so they can see how the project was being created and send them to their professor. That way they could follow up with them. Okay, so I like that because he, you know, this is one of the problems of group work, right? That, that everybody doesn't pull their weight. And this kid has obviously gone through the process of realizing, oh, you know, it would have been better if I'd done my job on time, you know, and still yet, yet still he made it. Uh, group work again. This showed me to be more responsible and work on time management for my other classes. Even though it was very overwhelming at times, I'm glad I was part of this learning community. It had just opened my eyes to a whole other side of me. Okay, so this is the, this is, this is the cautionary tale. We overwhelmed them. I think two, two hips is good. <laughs> um, three hips maybe, but after three hips, they're really at a point. I mean, these students handled it well. You can see um, this is in English. I got a lot of B pluses here. These students handled it well, but the the students who would normally be doing fine in these classes were not doing so well. And um, especially Barbara lost a lot. Uh, and we were wondering why did Barbara lose more than me? Why did Barbara lose more than? And then suddenly it occurred because I only did two, and she did four. <laughs> it's sort of like a no-brainer right there. So um, I think that higher pack practices are wonderful. They inform all of my teaching. Everything that I do in the classroom has been informed by the pedagogy that I've become familiar with by working with the ASCNU. And uh, if anybody's interested, I did have a piece in the ASCNU's peer review uh, a while back on uh, learning communities. So I think learning communities are a wonderful, wonderful um, way to help students engage in their work. Um, I haven't mentioned Hispanic students here at all because it's kind of implied <laughs> at our college because uh, more than a quarter of our students are Hispanic and you know many of the ones up here are Hispanic as well. You know, so um, I just think that's what we wanted to offer is to say that. That these that these are wonderful. They're wonderful pedagogies. They're wonderful ways of engaging and getting your students to do fabulous things and to rise up to an occasion. But you also have to be careful. You know, obviously we didn't know in advance that we had a block class, and if we did, probably Barbara might not have done one of the swings, you know, or something like that. But um, even so, it is interesting also that those students who really did engage got a lot. You know, they really. Well, so students become overloaded with too many hips, hip demands in the same se semester. Students who become engaged tend to accomplish projects and receive high grades. Students who disengage tend not to complete projects and either drop the class or receive low grades. And most of those Fs were people who, who, who just stopped coming. You know, we reached out to them, but they, I think they were overwhelmed, you know. Uh, there are no middle of the road students. Students are either engaged or disengaged. So it, it becomes a kind of do or die thing. Um, I, I've actually had discussions with some people who have felt that that, that is a good thing about HIPS and, and SWIG in particular in that it, it will sort out the first semester. 
you know, <laughs> who's going to go forward in some ways. But I think four hips is a little brutal, you know. If we, if we had our time again, we would not have loaded those students yet. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 please. But I'm done, <laughs> actually. At Cleveland College in, in New York, uh, all for some full-time freshmen, as well as sophomores, use the learning community model. Right. And our retention. Oh, all of them? The entire oh, wow. uh, for some for that it's you know this is a college model it's mandated our retention rate is eighty three percent that's one of the highest in the country yeah. um, my question to you is at at Kingsborough, is this mandated for for some full time freshmen or how no. does it work no and, and by the way if it's not what is your retention rate for for some full time freshmen uh, retention rate for first time full time freshmen Kathy might have it do you have the figures I I heard, I'm like yeah, um, Kathy and I are on the SWIG leadership team together. Kathy's also the, the co coordinator of the SWIG. What is your title, Yeah, like a co-leader of CAPSWIG. CAPSWIG initiative. So the way it's organized, it comes through CETL, our Center for Teaching and Learning, and um, the HIPS each has a designated leader. Kathy's the leader for, for SWIG. And, uh, there's one other, you know, there's a co-leader who, uh, who couldn't make it to the conference. And then um, then we have the leadership team, so we do coordinate all the training and all of that. But in answer to your question, no, it is not college-wide. No, it is not mandated. Um, Kathy's trying to find the statistics. I don't know if we, maybe we can follow up with you uh, after this conference sure. about that. But... Um, yeah, there's, there's also a leader for uh, learning there's a what? A leader of learning community. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we do have a separate... It, 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 learning communities is a designated hit, a designated high impact practice, but it is not mandated, and I, I would just love it if it was. <laughs> I, I think it's the most well, successful... I, I mean, you know, as I said, we're a four-year public, and the, the struggles with dealing with a large Latino population, but it has worked, and... and um, it's truly an amazing concept, uh, and, and it really does work. My only concern is, if it's not targeted, and, and then you put it out there, how many students would understand the dynamics of how it works to say, you know what, I want to sign up for this, because I think this, this is something that can benefit me. Well, and, we and don't so even give them that opportunity, because this is all faculty driven. So we have CETL coordinates, and, and as a leadership team, we're doing all the training of faculty, but the faculty are volunteering. It's faculty that come to us. You know, we do outreach. We're always, we, you know, we have like little fairs and things like that. We're trying to get them to come in. But um, it's totally faculty driven. If the faculty want to participate in this, they do. The administration supports it with a small stipend, you know, and that's so, it. So there's no governance, and, and there's no sort of mandate in terms of policy decisions. Right, right. Um, uh, well, go back to that. Well, well he said there's no, there's no well, overall... To target in the first time full-time freshmen coming in. No, but I would say we have, we have um, how Queensboro is structured is we have different academies based on your discipline. Okay. And um, so the first time full-time freshmen, they're either part of the Liberal Arts Academy, they're part of the Business Academy, they're part of uh, VAPA, which is Visual Performing Arts Academy, um, uh, uh, nursing has a separate, and so they do have dedicated advisors for each of those academies, and that was established a number of years ago. It was supposed to be for their first yeah. year. Well, what they actually they spend it to the whole, no, to the whole time that they're, yeah, to the whole time that they're at Queensboro. So, uh, but we don't have targeted learning community program. A number of years ago, we did, and I know that they're trying to. And, and well, what actually happened actually. was there was a dean there who was totally on board with this and she developed the freshman academy model and, and at that point we were working towards exactly what you're talking about exactly you know a mandated you know at least maybe not a mandated um, learning community but a mandated hit you know that every fre first time full-time freshman would experience a hit right that was the goal at that point unfortunately that dean left and, and the there was a vacuum. Eduardo Martí was the oh, president. Martí was behind, it, behind a lot of that as well. Um, and so with those two gone, there was kind of, you know, everybody wanted to keep doing what they were doing, but nobody really knew how, sort of thing. And it's, I think now we're kind of 
recovered and we're getting back into we're getting back into a more co coordinated thing. But they but, still love dedicated faculty who were involved. Yeah, in the, the faculty is amazing. Yeah, how that was all going to be. Yeah. Uh, now, what I picture uh, with the early warning system that you have, Starfish, yeah. can you imagine this working integratedly with that Starfish system? Clearly, your, your retention rates would be phenomenal. phenomenal. Well, a actually, you know, when, when I was I'm speaking for Barbara, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but Barbara's had a lot of trouble with Starfish because the first semester she, she kept flagging people and they disappeared after they were flagged because when she, when they flagged them starfish would follow up and um and she she kind of after talking to people you know after talking to with her students and everything she decided to only use starfish to flag positive things and her retention rate went up and she feels that we have no evidence but she you know i had a bad experience with starfish i was telling you yesterday i had a couple of bad experiences with it and um she sort of feels like these first-time, full-time freshmen who aren't really totally comfortable with college and their experience of high school has been, if they want to talk to you, you're in trouble. <laughs> you know? So there's a stigma. Attached. Yeah, so she, she stopped flagging students in trouble and just gave kudos. Because you, you have a choice in Starfish, kudos versus, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're not attending classes or anything like that. So she actually changed the way she used it as a result of her experience in the first couple of semesters with it. I think, yeah, I don't, I don't want to say anything negative about our, about, you know, Queensboro because we love yeah, it. Yeah, we, we love, love, we love that place. We absolutely but love it. when they implemented Starfish, they did not inform the students what it was. And they didn't say, hey, we're going to be using the system. It's going to help you um, stay on top of your classes. Hey, stay engaged with your professors. And I don't, I didn't realize this until actually last semester and I was saying to my students, I, I had said something about it. And they said, yeah, I was starfished. Like, that was a bad thing. And I was like, what? You know, it was like this black market thing. I got starfished. I'm like, no, you get positive responses, too. You get, so it, it, I think it could have been, um, or, you know, students don't always read their, their campus emails, right? Because they all have the private emails, which could also be another reason. But a lot of them were not aware of how starfish was supposed to function. Oh, I thought it was an embracing. You know that we were embracing you. Come, come, come back. Come yeah, back. We were reaching out to them, to it was it was more. Of, it. Oh, you know, I've been starfish. You know, I hadn't heard that, but that's 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 what Barb. That kind of, kind of reinforces what Barbara said. I've been starfish. You know, as in all different disciplines. Yeah, too, so. they're totally different disciplines, and that and so yeah, that is a, that is a pro, uh, Yeah, you, you don't want to be critical of the college, but I think starfish could have. You know, it's not working as well as it could. Perhaps it's better to say but that they're making efforts. Too. They're making efforts, and they are trying. You know, it's not, it's not. but yeah, that uh, the idea of at least a designated hip, if not if not a, a learning community. I personally think learning communities are such a powerful, uh, yes. a really powerful teaching. I'll, I'll have to give you my article on learning communities from the AFC your new sure. peer review. Yeah, I'm curious if, if your faculty are required to do a learning community, or they sign up and they volunteer. Well, no, what happens is um, they know that, that they have to be involved because it's a policy decision, right? Uh -huh. So, you know, it's not, it's not voluntary that they sign up. I mean, there's a designated number of staff members that are, you know, that, that are told that you, you're going to be teaching a first year experience uh -huh. and you're going to be teaching these learning community classes. And you know, that's the way How do you know with scheduling? I know one of the reasons that it's not mandated to well, the college is the schedule. Right, so. The schedule often would fall apart. We couldn't fill both classes, you know. Well, no, I think uh, uh, um, they, they've managed to, uh, you know, have enough classes uh, open at registration to fulfill the obligation. Okay. Um, but but because it's a policy decision. Uh, they have that latitude of, of building in classes, right? right. Uh, if, if it's not mandated by the president all the way down, then, then you know what happens um, in terms of classes. You, you know, there's very little classes available, so the student, you know. Yeah. But because it's a policy decision, uh, they're, they're, the provost has earmarked certain classes to be open that uh, speaks to the learning community. Right. We call it LEH 100. 
And uh, it's first time, full time freshmen, and they walk in the door and say, You have to take this English class and walk with this other class right. in the learning community and store. Right. That's right. So the yeah, advisors should right. do it. Right. Right. Yeah. right. It's, it's supported fabulous. by the advisors. Yeah. Right. right. I would, I would right. love to be in that six months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Right. But if you look at the retention rate, it's 83%. That's, it's yeah. phenomenal. That is phenomenal. And then amazing. in my program, the sophomore year initiative, I picked the baton. And my sophomore to junior retention rate is 68.9%, which is almost 69%, which again is my 13 percentage points above the national yeah. average from yeah. sophomore to junior. Yeah, that's wonderful. Excellent. Um, and, uh, Can I ask a question? Yeah. <clears throat> those, those students, um, and I guess there's quite a few of them, who get W's and F's in these courses, so where did, do you make did you make any attempt to find out where they go? Because well, that, some, that, sometimes that students starts, will yeah. become overwhelmed in a course, and they'll and they'll make a um, you know, very pragmatic decision. Where I'm, where am I going to put my energy? And they just shut down over here, and then they shift their attention to try to salvage another course that they might be. Right. And then they then they come back. You know, then they come back. You know, I, I've seen this in, in some uh, kind of gatekeeper courses that we have in my program, which is biology program. But First, the first course, and then the cell biology, which is the third course, big upticks in workload. And the students get through those courses fine after that. But there are some who, you know, say, holy cow, I gotta do all of this? Yeah. And, you know, so, did you make any attempt to? to well, well, through Starfish, we did. We did try to find them, but, but that's something, to tell you the truth, we were also overwhelmed. <laughs> Um, we didn't have advanced notice, but I think I, th I mean I think that's the key. I mean you're dead right. That's the key. Who are those students? Why did they leave? And how do we bring them back? I mean that's the key. But I mean even you said the ones who get through do really really well. You know if they can get through this stuff, uh, it's terrific. I it's, mean, it's you know it's that it's that whole issue of, of um, you know, flexible mindset and just adapt to the workload, and, you know divide and conquer kind of thing. And students. Figure that out and put themselves to it, fine. Right. And, and it's a matter of you know getting them to, to change from that you know from that fix to the growth mindset. You know. Exactly. That's, that's exactly. Uh, I think I think well, that's, that's exactly the piece. I think that's exactly right. And, um, uh, you said something then that. Oh, sorry. Um, well, well, just that that. Um, It's those students who don't adapt. I mean, really, in a way, we're, we're teaching them adaptation. We're, we're teaching them that capacity to transfer knowledge, to deal with what's going on. But what actually happened in my class is the more I kept more of mine, because they made that decision. That speech class has got too, too much. It was a very heavy course. And they did make that rational decision. I think I kept, it was a small class anyway, but I think I kept between three, I think it was three or four students that Barbara lost. And it was purely a workload. It was purely a workload thing where they made made that strategic decision. This is too much. This I can succeed with. This I can't. And, and I don't know how you get over that. I really don't. Other than you know, we we'll follow up. But yeah. No, I think that I think that's. I think you're describing exactly the right thing. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, is it time for one more? Or no. No. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.